Vanessa Barker is a professor of sociology at the Stockholm University and an associate director of Border Criminologies. Her research focuses on the questions of democracy, welfare state, the criminalization and penalization of migrants, and the role of civil society in the penal form. She's also the author of the book Nordic Nationalism and the Penal Order, Walling the Welfare State. She was recently a visiting academic at the Center for Criminology at the University of Oxford and the previously a visiting fellow at the Law and Public Affairs Program at Princeton University. So, <laughs> uh, thank you very much. I want to uh, just express my gratitude for the really kind invitation um, to come to, um, to learn to the Pufendorf to be part of this discussion. I, I uh, genuinely feel honored to have been uh, invited. I didn't have to fly so far as everybody, everybody else, but uh, I'm still very pleased to be here. I want to pick up um, some themes that um, Professor Cassells mentioned this morning about, about violence, but I want to talk about violence within the societies. So violence, insecurity, and harm that aren't somewhere out there in some other part of the world, but very much part of our world and how our society, Sweden in particular, is dependent upon this violence and how it is doing violence um, onto others right here, actually, and, and right now. And this is what the, uh, my book is about. Um, I want to take you um, back now, it's been three years since the uh, solidarity crisis in Sweden, the summer of 2015 in the fall, as an entry point into raising some of these um, d larger questions about inclusion, belonging, and the use of state violence. So um, many in the audience may be familiar with the story, but this was the height of the summer of 2015. Sweden said, yes, um, you're, you're welcome to come into Sweden to seek asylum. My Europe, this is our prime Prime Minister, I guess not anymore, but um, our, my Europe doesn't build walls. This was uh, in a, a solidarity march in Medborgplatsen uh, by the end of summer, but um, by the fall, there started to be a, a, a concern about the numbers in Sweden and new discourse um, entering into the idea of, um, of what, what could Sweden do? Could, could Sweden continue at this pace? This is a graph, just to, the, the dark blue line is the number of asylum seekers entering Sweden. The peak, um, this was in the fall of 2015. So at the, the highest peak was about 10,000 people um, coming in per week. And this has started this, um, this shift in the government's discussion of um, what, how Sweden was going to respond to the refugee crisis. By November 2015, um, the prime minister says, the government now considers the current situation with the large numbers of people entering the country in a relatively short period of time poses a serious threat to public order and national security. So here we have in November um, these terms about uh, public order and national security coming to the fore as um, a reason to, um, to switch gears, 180 turn from opening the border to closing the border. It seemed like this happened overnight. Um, this is a border closing. This isn't, some of you may have come in through Kastrup. This is the airport um, connecting uh, Sweden I mean, excuse me, Denmark, um, Kastrup, Copenhagen, into Sweden. This is the border closing, and I want to come back to this image of the fence because this is also important to, I think, to look at vi vividly. This is not the Berlin Wall, uh, nor is this the barbed wire that's in Serbia um, with Hungary and Serbia. This is the fence, but this is historic because this is between Sweden and Denmark um, within the Schengen, but also uh, a Nordic collaboration that goes back literally hundreds, hundreds of years. So the question is, why does this happen, right? So the government's official story is that this was a, a system overload. The, the welfare state couldn't handle anymore. Sweden had done enough. Um, we had taken in the second highest per capita, um, that this was, the system was going to collapse and that Sweden had to do something to shore up um, security on the inside. There's other um, analysis that's are coming, um, looking at Sweden, looking at all mobility restrictions across the global north, and they highlight old forms of, uh, hold in new forms of colonialism, saying this is a new form of colonialism, xeno-racism, very powerful, neoliberalism, as we heard this morning. Um, I want to highlight uh, a different theme and really return to the idea and the logic of the welfare state itself, and then highlight this, this use of violence. My book and my argument is that there are these global forces that are going on. Racism certainly plays a role. Um, economics uh, certainly plays a role. But there's something particular about the Nordic context that we need to understand. Um, and what 
is driving, right, this closure and this restriction has to do with this desire to maintain, right, the welfare state, sustainability, the solvency, this affluent life, this high quality of life, this equality of life and security for people on the inside. So it's this idea of protecting the bubble. So we are, we are not in a period of austerity here, so this should be clear in a comparative perspective. Um, we are in a period, Sweden is one of the most affluent countries in the world, so one of the top 10. Um, we've had restructuring of the welfare state, but not a retrenchment. And life is a very high quality for most people. And this idea, right, of the solvency and the sustainability is what's driving, uh, driving these closures. So I wanted to look at a longer history of the welfare state and see right, how this, this desire to kind of shore up, close up the welfare state for members right, is, was allowed for this uh, immediate border closure. To understand the welfare state, um, I think f first and foremost it may seem obvious now, but it's a national project. So when we talk about nationalization or renationalization, the welfare state has always been a national project um, in the Nordic countries, where universal aspects are they're conditional. I mean, first and foremost, about being a national, right, being a member of the society. Um, but also, I think in this historical period of time, a movement away from an international workers' movement towards a domestic national movement of citizens who would produce, contribute, and receive and gain back from the welfare state. It's kind of the underlying um, institutional uh, configuration. Producerism, this is also something I think is in, important to understand, especially some of reluctance of taking in new members. So the welfare state grows and develops because people produce, they contribute. Economic growth is based on investment. We all, it's the cycle right, of production, and we all produce. Anyone who's considered to be unproductive, non-productive, is already questionable. The history of alcohol, right, or of, of people who are, um, of homeless people, for example, alcoholics, the newly arrived, um, the questions about whether or not they're going to produce and contribute to the welfare state. So rather than uh, newly arrived being um, threats to the labor market, they're considered threats to the welfare state as potential drains. We've done enough, we've given too much. Sustainability and security being these key themes, right, Triket, uh, those in, in Swedish, this is a, a very deep and rich concept that uh, tries to convey both economic security as really vital and important for the society, but also social well-being and your social connections. This is this added feature I also think it's distinctive or important to understand, that it's not just an economic well-being, but how you feel secure with people around you. Trust. You trust other people in the society. So. Um, Security, sustainability, these uh, social security features at this moment in 2015, going back, were much more important than human security. So we also talk about the need for human security, but in this moment, social security in this particular space took over, that this was going to be the determining value, and Sweden closed the border. Knowing right, that people hadn't stopped moving, there was nothing different from the day the border closed from the previous week, the conditions right, for people seeking, seeking asylum. But we had closed the border and basically uh, denied the chance of these people from entering and to try to seek asylum in order to protect our own security, our own social well-being. And this idea, again, of the sustainability. So th this is, a very pro I think, a very problematic concept, but it's the idea that the, we have to keep the welfare state sustainable for us, for the future. We've invested, we've built it, we're going to get something. How much can the welfare state sustain right, new members? Um, but it's done from the position of the society and from the state. Sustainability for whom? For us inside. Certainly not from anyone coming in um, into the welfare state. What I want to highlight here, right, this idea that sustainability security is driving, right, this, these decisions, right, that the, to close the border, to restrict migration, this is being held up and backed by penal power. So I studied criminal law, right, I study um, the use of um, punishment over time. And this feature, I think, is also important, I think, for migration studies to bring into the analysis, right, that the criminal law, the punishment, policing power is integral into this restrictive migration policies. It's not something that's just mobilized temporarily, but it is part of the structure of limiting and man managing and keeping out um, migration. Penal power is being used to uphold the welfare state, right? not as a substitute for it. This is a, maybe a side 
disciplinary argument, but there's an argument that says from Louis Vicomte, if you're familiar with his work, as welfare states decline, the police state rises. It's this, right? So the police state replaces the welfare state. This is not what's happening in Sweden or, the, or, or in the Nordic countries. You have a strong welfare state, and it's dependent on this policing power, right, to keep out others, to keep this bubble, right, for us. Those are on the inside. Um, methods, I probably have no time to talk about methods, although I, I really enjoy it. I, <laughs> I teach two courses on methods. I would love to talk about this, but um, I'm a historical institutionalist in sociology. I'm looking at a case study, so I'm very much concerned with the long durée of institutional development. And I do want to say one thing about um, methods is that we have a tendency to look in the present moment to find out what's happening, what are the initial causes, what are the proximate causes, how do we understand the border closing or this, the, the immediate causes of maybe election results. Those are important, right? But they're often determined by longer term processes. And so when we you know, move our time horizons further back, even five years back, our understanding of the present changes. When we, under, when we move that time horizon back 30 years, our, our understanding of the present is transformed. When we go back 100 years, oh, we start to see what's happening in 2018. It actually looks a lot like what happened in 1918 in Sweden, the first Aliens Act. Um, so in my book, I go back 100, over 100 years to trace out the development of migration, of the welfare state, and of criminal justice over time to try to get at this continuing uh, logic that's underneath it. And it, it is, I think, very revealing. So just highlighting here one of the, um, this comes from Paul Pearson, we like short-term causes, short-term outcomes. I'm looking at long-term causes, social fault lines, how the society is organized, and looking at both short-term outcomes, the border closed, and this development of a new legal order, which I'm calling penal nationalism, which is the use of criminal justice measures to deal with um, unwanted mobility. Um, I can't help myself with the methods. So well, one more point here is that um, this is also about complex causality. So I'm in the social sciences, but we're looking, I'm looking at nonlinear outcomes, nonlinear causes. It's relational. So we're familiar probably with intersectionality, right? Gender, race, um, sexuality. Well, we can think about interrelational aspects, intersectionality of institutions as well, right? So the welfare state interacting with punishment, the criminal justice system, or membership citizenship, migration. The, the graph you can't really see here, but we tend to in our discipline, that's why I like being in this interdisciplinary space, we tend to look at one sphere in isolation. So if you look at the welfare state in Sweden by itself, it looks pretty good. If you look at the criminal justice system, low imprisonment rates, not many people in there, it looks pretty good. It has had a history of migration, open citizenship. When you put these fields together over time, it looks radically different. Um, I talk about, Mills talks about chemical causality. We can think about some of these configurations are actually quite toxic when they come together. Um, using the policing power to police membership. Who belongs, who doesn't belong. Um, and using that kind of power. Um, I think, yeah, I don't really have time, but I do want to say this too about the membership because these, my story is not one piece, it's these interactions with these three spheres. The folk emit who belongs in the welfare state, the foundation is cracked, right? It's not a, a equal society for everybody. It is a cracked foundation about who, um, who can belong. I want to highlight here in Sweden, right, looking over time, uh, who belongs in the society, how we define it, how we imagine it, how we count the population. And these have to do with administrative powers, which help to classify who belongs in the society. This is going to matter because those who are on the outside of these spheres, those who are seen as partial members or non-members, are more vulnerable and subject to exclusions, including policing power in the criminal justice system. So just briefly here, this kind of background, I'm working with Bourdieu, some of Bourdieu's ideas about the state as being very powerful to represent reality. So even though I think there are civil society movements that are important in resistance. The state ultimately is, ha is defining this power of who's belonging and not. And I think we might have an interesting conversation at the end of this. But this authority to make order, to represent reality, and by classifying certain people as members or non-members, it can break certain people, individuals, from this narrative of shared belonging. 
And if you're familiar with um, uh, Andreas Wimmer's work, he has these fantastic metaphors about fission and fusion. So some, t some societies can bring different kinds of people together in fusion. You can recognize difference, but they're fused together, part of one narrative, part of one whole, and they can go forward into the society. Fission is that you have different groups, different, different, uh, different levels of belonging, different groups that can come together, and you recognize them, but they're, it's fission, they split apart, and they push apart. So you don't have a whole, you have this, this broken part. And Sweden, Sweden has had elements of both of these, and in this current period, we're in this period of fission. We recognize difference, right, the newly arrived, we, uh, but we are also in this part of, of growing divisions and of this, this fission. Uh, maybe I'll come back to that. Why this is important in the criminology word, world is that we know, this is a, one of the key findings from criminology, is that those who are least attached to the society, um, non-citizens, non-members, racial minorities, some ethnic minorities, those with the least political power are almost always subject to increased criminalization and penalization. I mean, it's, it's, it's a key finding. And in the case of migration, subject to all of these things in addition to expulsion and to hate crimes. So we've seen in this past election we had in Sweden a lot of reporting on immigration and crime. That was the focus. Not, although, not a whole lot of focus on the arson of the, of the um, of refugee asylum centers, homes, right, who are increased, um, increased and subject to these um, forms of violence. So I want to talk about penal power, right, and this violence of the society inside. So what's happening in Sweden, in the Nordic countries, in the EU, in North America, in Australia, in the global north, we have an increased use of penal power, the criminal justice, to m try to manage, block, restrict, and punish unwanted people. This works, right, because penal power uh, is part of, it's con I said before, it's constitutive of the nation and state. It's constitutive of state authority, going back to the creation of the modern state. It has a structuring capacity to produce order. The monopoly of the state, this is from Weber right, and Charles Tilley. The state has a monopoly on violence. It has structuring capacity to produce this order, to assert itself, and we recognize it. Penal power, this works and it's been very effective. It has a communicative capacity. This also comes from, from Bourdieu about symbolic violence, um, but also penal theorists who are working on the, the, the communicative capacity of the criminal justice to make meaning. Right? And what that means is the power to classify, to categorize the worthy, the unworthy, the criminal, the non-criminal, who belongs and who doesn't belong. It's this power to represent reality. We make people illegal, right? So you talked about this movement, no one is illegal. No one is illegal, right? They're made illegal right? through the criminal law and through administrative law. Uh, some images from Sweden um, that uh, highlight this policing power, the use of criminal justice, is that um, when we had this um, high numbers of, of people coming into Sweden to try to seek asylum, they came in through, on, usually through the train, uh, coming in through Malmo or stations around Malmo, and we have this poli like called the policing of the refugee crisis. Uh, and here you have the police officers uh, escorting people coming up into the um, rece reception center. So the police, you can obviously see them, they're in their yellow vests. So you might think, well, this looks completely natural. Of course the police would be there, right, to kind of provide security and order. But, right, from a critical perspective, we have to ask, like, of all the institutions of the state, why is the police there, right? So why isn't the migration board there? They're right around the corner. They could be there. And we had refugees welcome, right, the civil society NGO wearing the pink vests. They were there, right? They could have been the first front runners or the migration board or the Red Cross or any other, um, actually, another different government organization. But it's the police at the border at the territory. And so this matters, this is significant, right? So it's the communicative power to say who belongs, who doesn't belong. So we're already starting to question what these, what, what, what's up, what's, um, do these people actually belong? Have they done something? Did they come in here illegally? Um, should, we, are we, should we be afraid of them because they're coming through the police? Are the police providing them security? They're providing them security, are they providing us security? Right, who's it working for? 
Um, and I want to pause here and to say these things, like the symbolic violence of the state, these have material implications. Again, fast forward to, two, this is 2015. 2018, we just had this election, and all of the discourse about crime and immigration, those groups are linked, right? This was so part of our election cycle was about immigrants coming in, the newly arrived, coming with their crime, their different culture, this essentialist culture in view, right? Coming in, causing problems in these no-go zones. Right? This was accomplished very quickly, right? You have some doubt, some suspect, um, about their validity, about their legality, and then well, three years later, it's very e quick to see in the public discourse this link between immigration and crime. So penal nationalism, again, is this concept I'm developing. Others are working in this area of border criminologies, crimmigration. But this is really to highlight right, this form of power, penal power, um, material and symbolic violence used to decide who belongs in the country or not. And this is, uh, maybe people in study criminology, we kind of get this point right away. Criminal justice power is being used to decide on migration, right, or membership, or citizenship. Now, none of the newly arrived are entering with a criminal violation, right? But we're using a different, we're using this form to actually sort, sort people in and out. I want to highlight also that this is violent, right, that this is coercive, coercive power of the state. Um, it's imposing the policing power, and I'll illustrate a few more examples. This is Im imposes power over another's will, autonomy, free movement, self-determination, right? Being corralled, being coerced, being put into uh, particular um, put into particular boxes, or excluded, or expelled. Penal nationalism, the other part is, it's, this is a nationalistic purpose here, to uphold, um, in Sweden, it's, I'm saying it's to uphold the welfare state and national identities. You can also have penal nationalism that's working to uphold sovereignty. So many in the EU, we, we're concerned about some developments that are happening in Poland and Hungary and some of our East, Eastern European countries. They're concerned about their sovereignty being taken away from the EU. They're also using the criminal justice at heightened degrees to reassert their sovereignty. Right? So it can be in the, in the Eastern European context, it's highlighting their concerns and anxiety about sovereignty. In Britain, we might think about identity going on. Um, in Sweden, it's a lot about the welfare state preservation, which is linked to national identity. Mobil mobility here is conceived as a social threat to the social body rather than expression of rights. And I think um, Thomas was also talking about this. It's a, and um, Stephen too, a, a historical shift in how we even understand mobility. A few more illustrations here about um, the criminal justice means to deal with unwanted mobility and, and this fusing of what comes from the criminal law into migration. Um, we had in Sweden, but other places, the imposition of age tests during um, when uh, to, to, to determine the age of unaccompanied minors who are seeking asylum in Sweden. So if you're familiar with this, what this means is that young people, many were coming in from Somalia, from Afghanistan, from Eritrea, um, and they were tested to see how old they were. Were they, in fact, under 18? Right? And if they, were, if they were younger, they would receive more you know, protections and more a closer look at their case. So the Migration Board instituted these age tests to check uh, dental records, the knee bone scans to see whether or not how old they were. Uh, pediatricians were against this at the UN level, saying these age tests are unreliable. Um, we've now had a report in Sweden that said these age tests were unreliable. Um, what happened was you had young people coming into the migration center, photographed like a crime, basically like a crime scene, subjected to these fairly invasive tests to see how old they were, because it, that's starting from a position of suspicion in law and trust. We don't trust what age you are telling us. Um, pediatricians say it's very hard to age people. What also happened in Sweden was that a young person may have come in at 16, and it's been, for some large group of these young people, it took almost two years for their case to be settled. So by the time their case was heard, they were in fact 18. So they aged during this process. So, um, but these tools, where it came direct, uh, for, that's on the slide, but I forgot to say, they came from juvenile justice, right? So the juvenile justice system wants to know how old people are so that they know how much culpability, how much legal responsibility a young person has, right? That's to protect them. 
the migration board used this to deny protections, right? So it's also flipped um, when they uh, took, on these, um, took on these tools inside their institution. Policing membership, so we have border control in the city center. So this was going on prior to 2015 with Reva, if uh, was checking for people who had no longer had a legal right to stay in the country, um, checking people in public transit areas. So this is also the use of the police to do migration control. Um, to check who, who has a legal right to remain and who doesn't. Um, this is a couple of things that are going on, right? When we think about border control, it's not only occurring at the territorial border, right? It's occurring in airports, it's occurring offshore, it's occurring in air, um, lands far away from Sweden's border, but it's also occurring in the city center. So the national border, this is um, t in, in Stockholm. So our national border is being patrolled in the heart of Stockholm to see who belongs and who doesn't belong. And in this particular case, the use of the police, um, they were looking for people who didn't have a legal right to remain, so asking for identification. And who did they stop? They stopped foreign-looking people, right? Nine out of 10. And most of those people had, if not legal residents, had citizenship in Sweden. So it was a, um, a, bit, of a, a bit of a blow up. Also in Sweden, we have this um, use of the criminal justice to deal with um, homeless people. EU migrants who have come from Bulgaria and Romania to ask for money on the streets, um, legally, technically not able to deport them, um, but the government, this was uh, created different legislation to monitor public order and the use of the police. So here you have a response where you have using policing powers, um, public order campaigns to remove homeless people uh, who are on the street and EU citizens. So they're not treated as EU citizens with a right to, of movement, they're treated as a problem, as a burden um, who must be removed. And this is another part of the, the welfare nationalism story or welfare chauvinism. So these are some of Europeans' poorest people, but they have no access to any social services in Sweden. Or you have to be a national to access those services. And they're seen as uh, illegitimate uh, members. One of the most severe forms of this penal nationalism is the loss of liberty. So this is um, an immigration detention center uh, in Sweden, and it, we have several colleagues who've written a lot about um, detention centers. So immigration detention, what does that mean? It means that people who have immigration violations, people in Sweden who will be um, deported or expulsed, who have no longer a legal right to remain, will be removed from the country. And often they are put in these uh, detention centers upon removal. Uh, so this is a detention center, it's not a prison, but it's prison-like. So this is a recreation area, so you have a high concrete wall with a security parameter around it. Inside you have limited mobility, um, and people are not allowed to leave this facility. And I would just, maybe it's obvious, to, to, but I'll stress the point, the people in these centers have not committed a crime against the criminal law but they're subjected to the same kinds of penal harms of the violence that's intrinsic to criminal law. And these, we know this from studying of the prison and from studying detention centers. The loss of autonomy, self-determination, loss of liberty. If we think about what democratic societies offer, right, we take that away. Insecurity, exposure to violence inside these centers, stigma, the mark of criminality. So this is going back to that symbolic violence, right? Anyone who's been in there or going through there, um, and, uh, and in this case of forced removal and deportation. Other colleagues have written about deportation as a secondary form of punishment, right? Because you are expulsed from the country that you have come to. There's a set of literature, maybe some of you are working on that, people who return, forced, forced Returnees have a very uh, difficult time reintegrating back into their societies. They're seen as a failure, they're seen as st stained and as a stigma. Something must have been wrong with you if you didn't make it there. So it's not as if when we send people back that they are just free to carry on their life. And in some cases, we've had um, documented cases where people we have sent back have met uh, very um, violent ends in the end. Uh, and again, these people have not actually committed, uh, committed a crime. Um, why does this matter? I want to return to the fence, the geometry of the fence, to highlight some effects back onto the society. So 
Sweden imposed a border fence, it wasn't a wall, but we should actually think about what that fence is. I have a uh, collaboration with an architecture firm, and they were doing a project about walls, and, and they did this, one, one of them wanted to know the geometry of the fence. What would, what would happen, how do you kind of blow up what barbed wire looks like? And I thought that this image was very interesting because with the fence, it continues to radiate out. So it doesn't just stop at the lines, right? The geometry of it expands. And so this is meaningful to think about what the fence is actually doing. So we create a barrier, we prevent people from entering, but this expansion, right? It continues out, but it continues um, inward as well. So our, we might have the fence, right? We create security inside, but we are pushing out people. So our inward security is dependent on outward harm the imposition of insecurity on others. Like the geometry defense, it's expansive, it continues to go. It's not a restrictive form of power. And this is something I think when we think about the future with the, the, the changes in the legal order, this is an expand, we are developing new forms of power, right, that are operating in this dimension. The geometry defense, so it's expanding. I think about the brutalization effects back on the inside of the society. So in the long term, right, societies, democratic societies that rely extensively on coercion, the criminal justice, uh, can become more polarized and destable, destabilized. Now some would say, well, in the immediate aftermath, so that was my timer, I'll, I will wrap up. Um, in the immediate aftermath, there was a sense of security and stability. But we have to ask, what, what, make, what becomes of the society when a, a place like Sweden becomes overly, overly reliant on these uh, brutalization of the use of violence. It may seem invisible, we don't see this in everyday lives, but the people who are subjected to it, they feel it, right, every day in their, in their lives. What effect does it have back on us as a society, not only on the people that we harm and exclude? One question to think about, I've been asked, right, well, is this necessary to maintain welfare states, right? You just can't have everybody in. And I, I would reject that idea, um, that this is a necessary equation that's happening. Um, and we might think about in, the, in the, the next part of the conversation about moving towards civic repair and, and imagining shared futures right, with the welfare state intact. But first step of order, I think, is to recognize um, what we're actually doing to our society and in addition to the people we have um, excluded. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, we also have some time for your questions. Okay. So we can get a seat. And then after we take questions for Vanessa, we open up for the panel discussion between Stephen, Thomas, and uh, you again. Okay. So. <laughs> okay, we start with the microphone. No, we can water. We, yeah. But Thank you. Um, very interesting and somewhat sh shocking, this, I think. I just wanted to, to inform everybody that today uh, a study, there's a seminar in Stockholm, uh, a new study by the Delegation for Migration Studies, DELMI, uh, which has uh, Peter Esayason and somebody else has looked at the, uh, what this system does to asylum seekers. They've followed, uh, I think, 1,500 asylum seekers uh, and, and, and um, sort of uh, registered uh, survey their state of mind. What does this do to people? And, and find, um, in summary, as far as I understand, uh, that people have sort of completely lost uh, their sense of self-value, uh, their self-esteem. And this is persistent. This is not something that easily changes, even when people receive uh, residence permits, if they do that. And I think we should take note of the fact of the high uh, suicide rates among, among uh, young um, Afghans and so on and so forth. So it, this, uh, I mean, what you describe is partly what this does to Swedish society and to, to us and to our perceptions of security. Mm -hmm. But I think we have to take note of, of what this also does to those who are exposed to this kind of system. I absolutely agree. I, I absolutely agree. Um, I also think it's important to, um, I, I mean, we have to think of some new terms about bringing these things together so it's not the separation of this group in our society, but thinking about these, how these go together. 
Um, because I do think in Sweden, um, there isn't enough attention paid to uh, what is actually happening. But, again, this might be for later, I don't actually think empathy mm. is going to change things. I've mm. become very pessimistic about that. But I do think, uh, um, and I'm very curious to see this study from Delmi. I can ask some water. Yeah, okay, sure. So I think Why do you think yeah, empathy no. wouldn't help only? Well, I think, I think people um, who, in, maybe I'm just going to speak for criminology people because these are the people that I interact most with. I think when we discover, right, that these things are happening, mass incarceration in the United States, um, the use of criminal justice measures to deal with migration, and when we expose this in our research, we think there's going to be a loud public rallying. Mm. Yeah, this is wrong. That's not what's happening because I think the criminal justice system is seen as legitimate because it has this structuring power to make the state. And so these means are incredibly violent, but uh, you're, uh, you know, we, mo most people are not thinking that this is state violence. Mm. Um, it is state violence. But whether, so if you, if the empathy part, if you expose the violence that are happening to people, I don't think that's enough to actually change the political situation. I think it's, an, it's, it's a lot to motivate people to get involved um, in, in civil resistance or in civil mm. society movements, but um, many people think that these are legitimate means mm. to exclude, and the exclusion itself is legitimate. No. Okay. Yes, please. Could you just... What, what the, the question is, is it necessary for the welfare state has possible three answers, yes, no, and maybe. Uh, when you go back to uh, when, in Swedish uh, uh, folk hymn, you think that it has well, always been questionable, all its measures, they say sterilization uh, uh, in the 50s and 40s, what is a question, has been a question, but, and the same, qu uh, the same uh, query were raised, was it necessary then? Uh, many would, at that time would have uh, argued, yes it was, because we save uh, the working population from uh, uh, the cost of taking care of second generation of the, uh, of the handicaps. So what is, what is the purpose here with the question is if, we, if our answer is no, shall we uh, uh, call back the Westphalia project? Shall we get, uh, get rid of the national, uh, nation state? Uh, well, um, <laughs> uh, I, 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 think the bo I think the borders, I mean, I think this, um, I think it's actually, um, uh, was it Rousseau, right? We all share the earth, philosophers, yes, no, Kant, no. oh, the surface of the earth, no. But, but the idea that we all, we all share the earth more than the superficial, but kind of really deep down, what gives anyone the right to say you can't be a part of this society? And I think the idea of like rounding the society with a capital S is incredibly pop problematic, and the nation states reassert right, that boundary of who's in and who's out. But the other question, right, if people aren't willing to go for the no borders or no nation states, but still want a welfare state, and I, I, it raises uncomfortable questions in Sweden about the labor movement and about labor, because someone would say, well, maybe we can, um, I mean, the other thing about Sweden is that, I think Reinfeldt had said this, there's like 3% of the entire country that's developed. So the idea that we're at capacity, right, for people or population is incredibly problematic. The welfare state, the idea of social investment in people to grow the economy, that's a kind of economy that can always take in more, right? You build, you invest, you build, and it grows. So the idea that somehow there's limits on that, I think are also, it's a problematic thinking, which goes back to the membership at the core. And unless we open that up and move away from fo foreignness, for example, which is, I think, incredibly destructive in Sweden, that we retain this idea of, of you know, five, right, about five degrees of foreignness um, and op have a more uh, inclusive idea. <laughs> So it's, there's different dimensions here. One has to do with the labor market, one has to do with economic investment, and one has to really pins on addressing membership mm -hmm. in a serious way. 
and I wrote, I think I wrote it on the slide, but in the book, I think there's an ambivalence in Sweden that hasn't been fully grappled with um, about difference and face it. Mm. Okay. We have one more question here. Yes, thank you. Uh, I think your work is very helpful in trying to understand what's happened in Sweden the, the last couple of years. Uh, but I also think there are many similarities between earlier times uh, when the, the, the state has also been restricting uh, migration. So I was wondering if you con could comment on that, uh, because yeah, I understand you have been uh, writing quite a lot about the, the historical yeah. no, um, so this was, um, policies. I, I think I didn't mean to cut you off there. Um, yes, exactly. So. One of the reasons I think the, looking at the opening up the time horizons was when I looked at the first 1918 Aliens Act, right, and what the, tracking what happened to the Jewish population in Sweden um, or um, in other racial minorities. Um, this, is not a, this is not a happy history. It's not a linear history of once being closed and now it's open. Mm. There are periods of open and periods of closure. And I, one of the, another interesting, I think, periods has to do with a, this post-World War II labor migration that everybody celebrates. We, oh, Sweden brought in so many labor migrants and they're super integrated and a big success story. But what I discovered in reading some of the literature on this was that there was a period where the labor movement, labor unions, wanted to block migration, not because th there was an economic uh, abundance, too many. It was because they were concerned there were too many Yugoslavs. And this was a big push for getting more women into the labor market. And so you've had this long history of counterposing, this, which goes on today, Swedish women versus minority men or migrant men as somehow mm. that's the tension. Um, so you had that period, right? So you had an economic need for more migrant labor, but there was a, um, a move to, to um, end that labor and get more women into the labor market, which we celebrate, right, as a kind of women's movement, women in the labor market, but this was partly done in response. So I think that there's a long history of um, these closures. And again, Sweden, the story is, it's a, it's a complex history. It's not a, um, my book ends up being pretty rough and harsh um, about the exclusion and the closure, but there have been these periods of being open. But I think it's often characterized mistakenly as if it was just always open, or even multiculturalism. You know, that policy was an official policy for barely 10 years. Um, I mean, problematic policy. But it's not as if you look back and you have a 100-year history of some kind of open society towards migration. So it's absolutely vital to capture that. Okay. We get one more question. Are you still? OK. Diana. Um. Yeah, first things, I love your book. I think it's very imp an important, uh, really important contribution for with in critical criminology that we need much more in, in this country. So thank you very much for your work, thank really. You. Um, so my question is why? Um, so I, I'm, I'm concerned about some unhappy marriage and that is between critical criminology and critical race studies. So critical, I mean, and and, and I was a little bit concerned or disappointed when you have Bourdieu, Bauman, I don't know, well, you know, the, the, the usual. Mm. Uh, and we were speaking about decolonizing the university, I was thinking, why not much more focus on, on the tradition of race critical theory and understanding, I mean, what's, I mean, yeah. I mean, there's a lot of research on internal colonialism in Sweden, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that would be my, I mean, if you could write another book on Sweden, would, I mean, what, would that yeah. kind of unhappy uh, marriage be resolved in one way or another? Yeah. That would be. Then I have a, some kind of, a, kind of, not stupid comment, but kind of empirical comment, and that is about that, I mean, Sweden is not a bubble, and there's a lot of research now, I was thinking about Jan Terbon's new book that says that the levels of inequality among racialized groups in Sweden are at the level of South Africa. I mean, so in a way, what could you say about this? And, and I mean, that wouldn't challenge your argument, but in a way yeah. that uh, there's a lot, I'm mean, thinking about the violence towards racialized migrants as citizens, so that could be my other. 
Yeah, well, thank you. I, I appreciate the, um, the comments and uh, can answer in a number of different ways. So one is the, I use membership on my, um, rather than race. Um, because, but inside the chapters, there's two chapters on the history of the welfare state and membership, and it's, there's about the racialization and racial, racial biology, and, you know, connecting foreignness to, to racial exclusion. So it's very much integrated, but, I mean, you're absolutely right that it doesn't come out in, this, in, the, in the presentation that this is about race, because there, there are, because I think that it's, it has both racial connotations, and some racial groups have been um, excluded, but others, whites, poor alcoholics, uh, uh, others who have been marginalized have also been subjected to these forms of violence, right, go, going over, over time. And even if you think about, like in the criminal justice system, for example, um, some of the largest groups that are in there are um, people from Eastern Europe, not, Ro not Roma people, but people from Poland, for example, and they're not racialized in the same context. So, yeah, well, they are and they're not, but they're different, they're different, but membership is trying to signal that it, there's a, race dimension, a racial dimension, an ethnic dimension, a religious dimension, because you might also think um, Sweden, it's been a kind of a Lutheran, there's a, there's a whole story to be written about Lutheranism in this as well. So that's also part of membership, which is a religious dimension, and I could say much more about gender as well. To your point about the, this unhappy marriage between um, critical race studies and um, colonialism, th this is my next book. So <laughs> I, I am doing a project on the external border and penal imperialism. So the use of penal power that's based on the military power and hooking into those histories of colonialism. So it's right exa exactly on that topic. So I'll be um, drawing on that, the Swedish literature and the bubble question. So going back to membership, so the argument in the book, I mean, I don't actually use the bubble in the book, um, I, um, uh, is that the groups that are subjected to increasing inequality are the racial minorities and the newly arrived and the people on that edge of the membership. So you have a broad inequality, right, for those who are in the middle, and you have this, the top 1%, kind of spinning out of control, and then you have the long-term unemployed, who are Swedish nationals also, so they're also in trouble. Um, the long-term unemployed, and you have the, the, the people with a migration background. So, but I do, write, do address that in the book, and it fits because they're not part of the membership. Hmm. Okay, thank yeah. you very much, Vanessa.